Psychotherapy is such a personal and private process that it is a mystery to most people who have never gone through it. The following series is a unique effort that allows us to sit in on what is ordinarily a very private therapeutic experience. An actual patient was courageous enough and considerate enough to allow herself to be photographed while actually engaged in therapy with three different therapists. Thus, we are allowed the privilege of seeing and feeling what really transpires. A film series like this, in which three therapists, distinguished by their different orientations, share their therapeutic endeavors, has never been made before. We therefore wish to express our gratitude to Gloria, the patient, and to her therapists for allowing us to share in their therapeutic adventure. This series will be divided into three separate films. In the first film, we see Dr. Carl Rogers, founder of Client-Centered Therapy, interviewing Gloria. In film number two, Dr. Frederick Pearl, founder of Gestalt Therapy, is working with her. And in film number three, Dr. Albert Ellis, founder of Rational Emotive Therapy, is our therapist. Each therapist will first describe his system of therapy briefly. He will then demonstrate his work with Gloria, and then he will comment briefly on his work. Now, here is Dr. Carl Rogers. From my own years of therapeutic experience, I've come to feel that if I can create the proper climate, the proper relationship, the proper conditions, a process of therapeutic movement will almost inevitably occur in my client. You might ask, what is this climate? What, what are these conditions? Uh, will they exist in the interview with the woman I'm about to talk with whom I've never seen before. Well, let me try to describe very briefly what these conditions are as I see them. First of all, one question is, can I be real in the relationship? This uh, has come to have an increasing amount of importance to me over the years. I feel that um, genuineness is another way of describing the quality I would like to have. Uh, I like the term congruence, by which I mean that what I'm experiencing inside is present in my awareness and comes out through my communication. In a sense, when I have this quality, I'm, I'm all in one piece in the relationship. Um, there's another word that describes it for me. I feel that in the relationship, I would like to have a transparency. I would be quite willing for my client to see all the way through me that there would be nothing, nothing hidden. And when I'm real in this fashion that I'm trying to describe then, I know that uh, my own feelings will, will often bubble up into awareness and be expressed, but be expressed in ways that won't impose themselves uh, on my client. Then the second question I would have is, will I find myself praising this person? Uh, caring for this person. I certainly don't want to pretend a caring that I don't feel. In fact, if I dislike my client persistently, I feel it's better that I should express it. But I know that the process of therapy is much more likely to occur and constructive change is much more likely if I feel a real spontaneous prizing uh, of this individual with whom I'm working. A prizing of this person as a separate individual. Uh, you can call that quality acceptance, you can call it caring, uh, you can call it a non-possessive love, if you wish. I think any of those terms tend to describe it. I know that the relationship will prove more constructive if it's present. And then the third quality, will I be able to understand the inner world of this uh, individual from the, from the inside? Can I, will I be able to see it through her eyes? Will I be able to uh, be sufficiently sensitive to move around inside the world of her feelings so that I know what it feels like to be her, 
so that I can sense not only the surface meanings, but some of the meanings that lie somewhat uh, underneath the surface. I know that if I can let myself uh, sensitively and accurately enter into her world of experience, then change and therapeutic movement are much more likely. Well, suppose I am fortunate and that I do experience some of these attitudes in the relationship. What then? Well, then a variety of things are likely to happen, both from my clinical experience and from our research investigations. We find that if uh, attitudes of the sort that I've described are present, then quite a number of things will happen. She'll explore some of her feelings and attitudes more deeply. She's likely to discover some hidden aspects of herself that she wasn't aware of previously. Feeling herself prized by me, it's quite possible she'll come to prize herself more. Feeling that some of her meanings are understood by me, then she can more readily perhaps listen to herself, listen to what's going on within her own experience, listen to some of the meanings she hasn't been able to catch before. And perhaps if she senses a realness in me, uh, she'll be able to be a little more real within herself. I suspect there will be a change in the manner of her expression. At least this has been my experience in other instances. From being rather remote from her experiencing, remote from what's going on within her, uh, it's possible that she'll move toward more immediacy of experiencing, that uh, she will be able to sense and express what's going on in her in the immediate moment. From being disapproving of herself, it's quite possible she will move toward uh, a greater degree of acceptance of herself. From somewhat of a fear of relating, she may move toward being able to relate more directly and to encounter me more directly. From construing life in somewhat uh, rigid black and white patterns, uh, she may move toward more tentative ways of uh, construing her experience and of seeing the meanings in it. From uh, a locus of evaluation which is outside of herself, it's quite possible she will move toward recognizing a greater capacity within herself for making judgments and, and drawing conclusions. So those are the some of those are some of the changes that we have. If I have any success in creating the kind of conditions that I described initially, then we may be able to see uh, some of these changes in this client, even though I know in advance that our contact is going to be very brief. Good morning. Hello, I'm Dr. Razu. You must be Gloria. Yes, I am. Okay, this chair. No, no. We have half an hour together, and I really don't know what we'll be able to make of it, but uh, I hope we can make something of it. I'd be glad to know whatever concerns you. Well, I'm right now I'm nervous, but mm -hmm. I feel more comfortable the way you're talking in a low voice, and I don't feel like you'll be so harsh on me. But uh, I, I hear the tremor in your voice, so I'm <laughs> very uh, well, the main thing I uh, want to talk to you about is uh, I'm just newly divorced. And uh, I had gone in therapy before, and I felt comfortable when I left. And all of a sudden now, the biggest change is adjusting to my single life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that bother me the most is especially men and having men to the house and how it affects the children. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the biggest thing I want, the thing that keeps coming to my mind I want to tell you about is I have a daughter, nine, who at one time I felt I had a lot of emotional problems. I wish I could stop shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm real conscious of things affecting her. I don't want her to get upset. I don't want to shock her. I want so bad to, for her to accept me. Mm -hmm. And we're real open with each other, especially about sex. And the other day she saw a girl that was single but pregnant, and she asked me all about can girls get pregnant if they're single. And the conversation was fine, and I wasn't 
I'm at ease with all of her until she asked me if I'd ever made love to a man since I left her daddy, and I lied to her. And ever since that, it keeps coming up to my mind because I feel so guilty lying to her because mm -hmm. I never lie and I want her to trust me. Mm -hmm. And I want, I almost want an answer from you. I want you to tell me if it will affect you wrong if I told her the truth or what. And, and it's this concern about her and the fact that you really aren't, that this open relationship that has existed between you and I, you feel it's kind of... Yes, I feel damaged. like I have to be on guard about that because mm -hmm. I remember when I was a little girl, when I first found out my mother and father made love, it was dirty and terrible and mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't like her anymore mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to lie to Pammy either and I don't know... And you sure wish I could give you the answer as to what you should tell her. Oh, I'm afraid you're going to say that. Because mm -hmm. what you really want is an answer. I want to especially know if it would affect her, if I was completely honest and open with her, or if it would affect her because I lied. I feel like it's bound to make a strain because I lied to her. Mm -hmm. so because she'll it. suspect that or she will know something's not quite I right. I feel really inside she'll distrust me, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also I thought, well, she would about when she gets a little older and she finds herself in touchy situations. She probably wouldn't want to admit it to me because she thinks I'm so good and so mm -hmm. sweet. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm afraid she could think I'm really a, mm -hmm. a devil. Mm -hmm. And I want so bad for her to accept mm -hmm. me. And I don't know how much a nine-year-old can take. And really, both alternatives concern you, but she might think you're too good or better than you really are. Yes. And she might think that you're worse than you are. Not worse than I am. I don't know if she can accept me the way I am. I think I paint a picture that I'm all sweet and motherly mm -hmm. and... I'm a little ashamed of my shady side, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I see. It really cuts a little deeper. If she really knew you, would she, could she accept you? This is what I don't know, yes. I don't want her to turn away from me. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know how I feel about it, because there are times when I feel so guilty, like when I have a man over. I even try to make a special setup so that if I were ever alone with him, the children would never catch me and that sort of thing. Because mm -hmm. I'm real weary about it. Mm -hmm. And yet I also know I have these desires. So it's quite clear. It isn't only her problem or the relationship with her. It's in you as well. In my guilt. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I feel guilty what, so What often. can I accept myself as doing? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you realize that you set up sort of subterfuges so as to make sure that that you're not caught or something, you realize that you are acting from guilt, is that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't like the way, I would like to feel comfortable with whatever I do. If I choose not to tell Pammy the truth, to feel comfortable that she can't mm -hmm. handle it, and mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. I want to be honest, and yet I feel there are some areas that I don't even accept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you can't accept them in yourself, how could you possibly be comfortable in telling them to her? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you say, you do have these desires, and you do have your feelings, but but you don't feel good about them. Right. And I, I, I have a feeling you're just going to sit there and let me stew on it, and I, I want more. Uh, I want you to help me get rid of my guilt feeling. If I can get rid of my guilt feeling about lying or going to bed with a single man, any of that, just so I can feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd like to say... No, I don't want to let you just stew in your feelings. But on the other hand, I, I also feel that this is the kind of very private thing that I couldn't possibly answer for you, but I sure as anything will try to help you work toward your own answer. I don't know whether that makes any sense to you, but I mean it. Well, I appreciate you saying that. You sound like you mean it. But I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. I don't begin mm -hmm. to know where to go. I mm -hmm. thought that I'd pretty well worked over most of my guilt. And now that this is coming up, I'm disappointed in myself. Mm -hmm. I really am. Mm -hmm. I want, I like it when I feel that no matter what I do, even if it's against my own morals or my upbringing, that I can still feel good about me. And now I don't. Like, uh, there's a girl at work who sort of mothers me. And she just, she, I think she thinks I'm all sweet, and I sure don't want to show my more ornery, devilish side with her. I want to be sweet, and it's so hard for me to... This all seems so new again, and mm -hmm. it's so disappointing. Yeah, I get the disappointment that here, a lot of these things you thought you'd worked through, and now the guilt and the feeling that only a part of you is acceptable to anybody else. Yeah. That keeps coming out. I guess I, I do catch the real deep 
puzzlement that you feel as to what the hell shall I do? What can I do? Yes, and you know what I can find, Doctor, is that everything I start to do that I impulse, it seems natural to tell Pam or, or to go out on a date or something, I'm comfortable until I think how I was affected as a child. And the minute mm-hmm. that comes up, then I'm all haywire. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I want to be a good mother so bad, and I feel like I am a good mother. Mm-hmm. But then there's those little exceptions. Mm-hmm. Like, my guilt's with working. I want to work, and it's so fun having extra money. I like to work nights. The minute I think I'm not being real good to the children or giving them enough time, then I start feeling guilty again. Then that's when I'm, it's a, what do they call it, a double bind. That's just what it feels like. Mm-hmm. I want to do this, and it feels right, but after all, I'm not being a good mother, and I want to be both. Mm-hmm. I'm becoming more and more aware of what a perfectionist I am. That's what it seems like I want to be so perfect. Either I want to become perfect in my standards or not have that need anymore. Or I guess I hear it a little differently that uh, what you want is to seem perfect. But it means it's a great matter of great importance to you to be a good mother. And you want to seem to be a good mother even if some of your actual feelings differ from that. Does that catch you? Yeah, I don't mind? feel like I'm saying that. No, right. that isn't okay. what I feel, really. Okay. I want to approve of me always, but my actions won't let me. I want to approve of me. I, I think... I realize you... All right. But let me... Because I'd like to understand that. You sound as though your actions are kind of outside of you. You want to approve of you, but what you do somehow won't let you approve of yourself. Right. Like, I feel that I can approve of myself regarding, for example, my sex life. This mm-hmm. is the big thing. Mm-hmm. If I really fell in love with a man and I respected him and I adored him, I don't think I'd feel so guilty mm-hmm. going to bed with him. And I don't think I'd have to make up any excuses to the children because they could see my natural caring for him. Mm-hmm. Okay. But when I have the physical desire and I'll say, oh, well, why not? And I want to anyway. Then I feel guilty afterwards. I hate facing the kids. I don't like looking at myself. And I rarely enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And this is what I mean. If the circumstances would be different, I don't think I'd feel so guilty because I'd feel right about it. Yeah, I, I guess I hear you saying, if, if what I was doing when I went to bed with a man was really genuine and full of love and respect and so on, I wouldn't feel guilty in relation to Pam. I wouldn't, uh, I, I really would be comfortable about the situation. That's how I feel, yeah. And I know that sounds like I want a perfect situation, but that is how I feel. And in the meantime, I can't stop these desires. I've tried that also. I've tried saying, okay, I don't like myself when I do that, so I won't do it anymore. But then I resent the children. I think, why should they stop me from doing what I want? And it's really not that bad. But I guess I heard you saying, too, that it isn't only the But I guess I heard you saying, too, that it isn't only the children, that you don't like it as well when it right. really isn't. I'm right. sure that. I know that's it, probably even more so than I'm aware of. But I only notice it so much when I pick it up in the children. Mm-hmm. Then I can also notice mm-hmm. it in myself. Mm-hmm. Somehow, sometimes you kind of uh, feel like blaming them for the feelings you have. I mean, why should they cut you off from a normal sex life? Well, a sex life, I could say, not normal, because mm-hmm. there is something about me that says that's not mm-hmm. very healthy mm-hmm. to... Uh, mm-hmm. Just going to sex because you feel physically attractive or something, mm-hmm. or a physical need. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. something about it tells me that's not quite right anyway. Mm-hmm. That you feel really that at times you are acting in ways that are not in accord with your own inner standards. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But then we're also saying a minute ago that you feel you can't help that uh, either. I wished I could. That's mm-hmm. it. And I can't. Now I feel like a, I can't control myself as well as I could have before for a specific reason. Now I can't. I just let go and I have... There's too many things I do wrong that I have to feel guilty for and I sure don't like that. I want you very much to give me a direct answer and I'm going to ask it and I don't expect a direct answer but I want to know, do you feel that to me the most important thing is to be open and honest? And if I can be open and honest with my children, do you feel that it could harm them if, for example, I could say to Pammy, I was, I felt bad lying to you, Pammy, and I want to tell you the truth now. And if I tell her the truth, and she's shocked at me, and she's upset, that that could bother her more. I, mean, I want to get rid of my guilt, so that'll help me, but I don't want to put them on her. That's fair. 
Do you feel that could hurt you? Concern. I guess uh, I'm sure this will sound evasive to you, but it seems to me that perhaps the person you're not being uh, fully honest with is you. Oh. Because I was very much struck by the fact that you were saying, if I feel all right about what I've done, mm -hmm. whether it's going to bed with a man or what, if I really feel all right about it, then I don't have any concern about what I would tell Pam or, or my relationship with her. Right. All right. Now, I hear what you're saying. Then, all right, then I want to work tough. on, I want to work on accepting me then. I want to work on feeling all right about it. So that makes sense, that that will come natural and then I won't have to worry about him. Mm -hmm. But when things do seem so wrong for me and I have an impulse to do them, how can I accept that? What you'd like to do is to feel more accepting toward yourself when you do things that you feel are wrong. Is that right? Right. I feel like you're going to say, now why do you think they're wrong? And uh, I have mixed feelings there too. Mm -hmm. Through therapy I'll say, now look, I know this is natural. Women feel it. Sure, we don't talk about it a lot socially. But all women feel it and it's very natural. I've had sex for the last 11 years. I'm of course going to want it. But I still think it's wrong unless you're really truly in love with a man. And my body doesn't seem to agree. And so I don't know how to accept it. Sounds like a triangle to me, doesn't it? You feel that I, or therapists in general, or other people say, it's all right, it's all right, it's natural enough, go mm -hmm. ahead. Um, and I guess you feel your body sort of lines up on that side of the picture. But something in you says, but I don't like it that way, not unless it's really right. Well, I have a hopeless feeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are all the things I sort of feel myself, and I feel, uh, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. so, uh, this is the conflict, and it's just insoluble, and therefore it's hopeless. And here you look to me, and I don't seem to give you any help. Right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I really know you can't answer for me, and I have to figure it out myself, but I want you to guide me, or show me where to start, or mm -hmm. so it won't look so hopeless. Mm -hmm. I know I can keep living with this conflict and I know eventually things will work out, but I like feeling more comfortable with the way I live. Mm -hmm. And I'm not. And then you're to ask, what is it you wish I would say to you? I wish you would say to me, to be honest and take the risk that Pam is going to accept me. And I also have a feeling if I could really risk it with Pammy of all people, that I'd be able to see, here's this little kid that can accept me. And I'm really not that bad. If she really knows what a demon I am and still loves me and accepts me, it seems like it would help me to accept me more. Like, it's really not that bad. I want you to say, to go ahead and be honest. But I don't want the responsibility that it would upset her. That's right, I don't want to take responsibility. Yeah, no, yeah. You know very well what you'd like to do in the relationship. You would like to do yourself, and you'd like to have her know that you're not perfect, and you do things that maybe even she wouldn't approve of, and she disapprove of to some degree yourself. But that uh, somehow she would love you and accept you as an imperfect person. Mm. Like I wonder if my mother had been more open with me, maybe I wouldn't have had such a narrow attitude about sex. If I would have thought that she could be, you know, pretty sexy and ornery and devilish too, but I would look at her as being such a sweet mother that she could also be the other side, but she didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where I got my picture. I don't know, but I want Pammy to see me as a poor woman, mm -hmm. but also accept me. Mm -hmm. You don't sound so uncertain. I don't? What do you mean? What I mean is, you've been sitting there telling me just what you would like to do in that relationship with Pam. I would, but I don't want to quite take the risk of doing no, it unless the authority tells me that. 
it's I guess one thing that uh, I feel very keenly is it's an awfully risky thing to live. You'd be taking a chance on your relationship with her. You'd be taking a chance on letting her know who you are, really. Yeah, but then if I don't take a chance, if I feel loved and accepted by her, I'm never going to feel good about it anyway. If, if her love and acceptance of you is based on a false picture of you, what the hell is the good of that? Is that, is that yes, that's what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also feel a lot of responsibility with being a mother. With I don't I don't want to feel like I've caused any big traumas in the children. Mm -hmm. I don't like all that responsibility. I think that's what I don't like it feeling it could be my fault. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I meant when I said life is risky. It's uh, to Take the responsibility for being the person you would like to be with her is a hell of a responsibility. It is. A very frightening one. You know, I, I look at it two ways. I like to see myself as being so honest with the kids and really being proud of myself, though, that no matter what I told them or no matter how bad they might think I was, I was honest. Mm -hmm. And down deep, it's going to be a much more wholesome relationship. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I get jealous of, like, when they're with their daddy. I feel he's more to this. He's not quite as real. He's not quite as honest. But nevertheless, they see a sweet picture of their dad. You know, he's all good with some light. And I'm envious of that, too. Mm -hmm. I want them to see me just as sweet as they see him. And yet I know he's not quite as real with him. Mm -hmm. So it seems like I've got to swap the one to the other. Mm -hmm. And I know this is really what I want the most, but uh, I miss some of that glory. Yeah. You sort of feel... I want them to have just as nice a picture of me as they have of their dad. And right. his is a little... Penny, then maybe mine will have to be two. I guess putting it a little too strong. That's close. That is mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, she can't have that neat a picture of me if I were honest. <laughs> Besides that, I do feel I'm a little more ornery than their dad anyway, so I'm likely to do more things that they disapprove of. And they really find it quite hard to believe that they would really love you if they knew you. That's right. You know, that's exactly it. Before therapy, you know, she can't have that neat a picture of me if I were honest. <laughs> Besides that, I do feel I'm a little more ornery than their dad anyway, so I'm likely to do more things that they disapprove of. Sounds like you really find it quite hard to believe that they would really love you if they knew you. That's right. You know, that's exactly it. Before therapy, I would have definitely chosen the other area. I'm going to get respect from them no matter what, even if I have to lie. But right now, I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I'm not positive they'll truly mm -hmm. accept me. Mm -hmm. Something tells me they will. I know they will, but I'm not positive. I'm not reassuring. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I keep wanting these things. You're in kind of a no man's land of probably shifting from one point of view to them to another, but boy, you'd sure like somebody to say, that's right, you go yes. ahead and do it. Yes, that's why I get encouraged when I read in a book from somebody I respect and admire mm -hmm. that this is the right thing, no matter what honesty will win out. Well, then it keeps giving me confidence by gosh, I'm right. Mm -hmm. But It's so damn hard to really choose something on their own, isn't it? Which makes me feel very immature. I don't like this in me. I wish I were grown up enough and mature enough to make my decisions and stick by them. Mm -hmm. But I need somebody to help me out, somebody to push me. So you kind of reproach yourself for that, I guess, and feel, why if I was anybody or if I was grown up, I'd be mature enough to decide things like this for right. myself. Right. And take more risks. I wish I'd take more risks. I wish that I could just well, go ahead and be this and say, however the children grow up, I've done my best. I didn't have to constantly have this conflict. Mm -hmm. And I'd like later just to say, no matter what you ask me, kids, at least I told you the truth. You may not have liked it, but it's been true. That somehow I can admire. I, I disrespect people that lie. I hate it. So you see what a double line I am in. I hate myself if I'm bad, but I also hate myself if I lie. So uh, it's accepting. You want to become more accepting. I guess, judging from your tone of voice, 
you kind of you hate yourself more when you lie than you do in terms of things you disapprove of. I do. I do. Because this has really bothered me. This happened with Pam about a month ago, and it keeps coming to my mind. I don't know whether to go back and talk to her about it. Oh, wait, she may have even forgotten what she asked me. But, uh, it's point just, is, you haven't forgotten. I have. No, I haven't. And I'd like to at least be able to tell her that I remember lying, and I'm mm-hmm. sorry I lied, and it's been driving me bugs because I did. I don't know. I feel like now that's solved, and I didn't even solve the thing, but I feel relieved. I uh, I do feel like you've been saying to me, you're not giving me advice, but I feel like you're saying you really want to, you know what pattern you want to follow, Gloria, and go ahead and follow it. I sort of feel backing up from you. I guess the way I sense it is. Uh... You've been telling me that you know what you want to do, and yes, I do believe in backing up people and what they want to do. It's just a little different slant than the way it seems to you. Are you telling me? One thing that concerns me is uh, it's no damn good you're doing something that you haven't really chosen to do. That's why I'm trying to help you. Find out what your own inner choices are. But then there's also a conflict there because I'm not really positive what I want to do. The lying part, yes, but I'm not positive what I want to do when I go against myself. Sure. Like when I bring a man to the house, I'm not sure I want to do that. If I feel guilty afterwards, I must not have really wanted to. I'm interested well, what you say. I'm not sure which words you use, but you don't want it, you don't like yourself, or you don't approve of it when you do something against yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, this is so different. Now, this kind of thing that we're talking about now, it isn't just knowing whether you want to do something or not. If I want to go to work in the morning or I don't want to go to work, that's easy. But when I find myself doing something I don't feel comfortable with, I automatically say, if you're not comfortable, Gloria, it's not right. Something's wrong. All right, now what I want to ask you is, how can I know which is the strongest? Because I do it, does that mean that's the strongest? And yet, if I disapprove, that's just part of the thing that's got to go along with it. See, it sounds like you're, I'm picking up a contradiction. I'm not, a, I'm not following. It sounds like you're feeling a contradiction in yourself, too. Although you, what I heard you saying in part is, uh, the way you like it is when you feel really comfortable about what you're doing. Yes. And I have at times when I've made a decision. Mm-hmm. Now that seems right, that seems perfectly right, no conflict. But then there are times I do things that I feel uncomfortable with. So that there is a conflict there. Mm-hmm. It's not the same at all. So what I'm saying is how do I really know when I'm following my true feelings if I have conflicts afterwards or guilt afterwards? I see, because in the moment it may seem like your true feelings. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm starting to do it, okay. Mm-hmm. 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 So that really is tough to uh And if you feel comfortable in the moment about it, but then afterward don't feel at all comfortable, which course of action was really the one you should have followed? You know, the most outstanding thing, I don't know if you're following me when I say about this conflict, but one thing I know is I've wanted, for example, to leave my husband for quite a few years. Mm-hmm. I never did it. I kept thinking how nice it would be or how scary it would be, but I never did it. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden when I did, it felt right. I didn't feel mean toward him. I just knew this is what I had to do. That's when I know I'm following myself. I'm following my feelings completely. I had no conflict there. Some unhappy things came from it, but I still had no conflict. That, to me, is when I'm following my feelings. And in everyday life, the small little decisions, the small little things to do, don't come out that clear at all. So many conflicts come mm-hmm. out. Right. Is this natural? Although you're saying, uh, I expect it is, but, but you're saying, too, that you know perfectly well a feeling within yourself that occurs when you're really doing something that's right for you. I do. Mm-hmm. I do. And I miss that feeling other times. And it's better when you clue to me. Mm-hmm. You can really listen to yourself sometimes and realize, oh, no, this isn't the right feeling. This isn't, mm-hmm. this isn't the way I would feel if I was doing what I really wanted to do. But yet many times I'll go on and do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And say, oh, well, I'm in the situation now. I'll just remember next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned this word a lot in therapy, and, and most therapists grant at me or giggle or something when I say utopia. But when 
I do follow up on how I feel the good feeling inside me. That's sort of utopia. That's what mm-hmm. I mean. That's the way I like to feel, whether it's a bad thing or a good thing. But I feel right about me. I, I sense that so in those utopian moments, you really feel kind of whole. You feel all in one piece. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it uh, gives me a choked up feeling when you say that because I don't get that as often as I'd like. Mm-hmm. I like that whole feeling. That's real precious to me. That's good. None of us get it as often as we like, but I really do understand that. Mm-hmm. It really does touch you, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know what else I was just thinking? I feel this dumb thing that, uh, All of a sudden, as I'm talking, I thought, gee, how nice I can talk to you, and I want you to approve of me, and I respect you, but I miss that my father can talk to me like you are. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like to say, gee, I'd like you for my father. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't even know why that came to me. You look to me like a pretty nice daughter. You really do miss the fact that you, you couldn't be open with your own dad. Yeah, I couldn't be open, but I, I want to blame it on him. I think I'm more open than he'd allow me. I mean, he would never uh, listen to me talk about like he wants to talk about mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.
in many ways, I'm glad that she kept uh, pushing me for an answer to her very personal questions about her sex life and her relationship uh, to her daughter. I say I'm glad of this because as the relationship developed, it became, I think, completely clear to her as well as to me that she was seeking something a good deal deeper than that. Incidentally, I'd like to pay my tribute to her uh, deep honesty and being willing to talk about herself so freely. Although every individual is entirely unique, and in this respect I was definitely unprepared for and sometimes surprised by the material she brought up, still in another sense this was very typical of, of my experiences in therapy. When I'm able really to let myself enter into a relationship, and I feel that this was true in this instance, then I find myself not only being increasingly moved by being in touch with the inner world of my client, but I find myself bringing out of my own inner experience statements which seem to have no connection with what's going on, but which usually prove to be uh, or prove to have a very significant relationship to, to what the client is experiencing. I felt there were one or two incidents of this kind in this brief interview. I was genuinely moved, I probably showed it, by the fact that she told me near the end of the contact that uh, she saw me as the father she would like to have. My reply was also a thoroughly spontaneous one, that she seemed to me like a pretty nice daughter. I guess I feel that we're only playing with the real world of relationships when we talk about such an experience in terms of transference and counter-transference. Uh, I feel quite deeply about that. I, I want to say, yes, we can put this experience into some such uh, highly intellectualized framework, but when we do that, it completely misses the point of the very immediate I-thou quality of the relationship at such moments. I felt that uh, Gloria and I really encountered each other, and that in some small but, I believe, lasting way, we were each of us enriched by the experience. I'm saying these things almost immediately after the conclusion of the interview, and as is characteristic of me, there are not more than one or two statements or incidents which I recall from the interview. I simply know that I was very much uh, present in the relationship, that I lived it in the moment of its occurrence, and I realize that after a time I may begin to remember it too. But at the present time I really have uh, a very non-specific memory of the whole uh, interview. I'll try to look at it though a little bit more from an intellectual rather than a strictly feeling point of view. Gloria showed what I've come to feel are characteristic elements of therapeutic movement. In the first part of the interview, she was talking about her feelings, and they were past feelings. She was talking about aspects of her behavior and of herself as if she didn't quite own them. She was looking outside herself for a center or locus of evaluation, some source of, of authority. She saw some of the things she was talking about in fairly black and white uh, fashion. By the end of the interview, uh, she was experiencing her feelings in the immediate moment, not only as evidenced by her tears, but by her ability to express very directly and with immediacy her feelings toward me. She was also much more aware of her ability to make her own judgments and, and choices. I guess uh, put in terms that have become somewhat commonplace, you could say that she moved from the there and then of her life to the here and now of elements that she was discovering in herself and feelings that she was experiencing in the moment in her relationship with me. All in all, 
I feel good about the interview. I guess I feel good about myself in the interview. And like Gloria, I feel very real regret that the relationship cannot continue. to interview a patient and I'd like to give you some thumbnail sketch of what Gestalt therapy stands for. Uh, Gestalt therapy is working on an equation. Awareness, equal present time, equal reality. In contrast to depth psychology, we try to get hold of the obvious, of the surface of the situation in which we find ourselves and to develop the emerging gestalt strictly on the I and thou, here and now basis. Any escape into the future or the past is examined as a likely resistance against the ongoing encounter. A modern man has alienated given up so much of his potential that his ability to cope with his existence becomes badly impoverished. My aim is this. The patient should recover his lost potential. He should integrate the conflicting polarities, understand the difference between game playing, especially the playing of verbal games, on the one hand and of genuine, authentic, beha confident behavior on the other. The civil war of inner conflicts weakens the efficiency and comfort of the patient, but every bit of integration will strengthen it. Now, in the safe emergency of the therapeutic situation, I repeat, in the safe emergency of the therapeutic situation, the patient begins to take risks and to transform his energies from manipulating the environment for support into developing greater, greater self-support that is reliance on his own resources. This process is called maturation. Once the patient has learned to stand on his own feet emotionally, intellectually and economically, his need for therapy will collapse. He will wake up from the nightmare of his existence. The basic technique is this. Not to explain things to the patient, but to provide the patient with opportunities to understand and to discover himself. For this purpose, I manipulate and frustrate the patient in such a way that he's confronting himself in this process, he identifies with his lost potential, for instance, through assimilating his projections by acting out, by acting out the alien parts of himself. Principally, I consider any interpretation to be a therapeutic mistake, as this would imply that the therapist understands the patient better than the patient himself takes away from the patient a chance of discovering himself by himself and prevents him from finding out his own values and style. On the other hand, I disregard most of the content of what the patient says and concentrate most on the non-verbal level as this is the only, which, only one which is less subject to self-deception than his verbal pseudo-self-expression, on the non-verbal level, the relevant gestalt will always emerge and can dealt with in the here and now. <laughs> But you're smiling. I don't understand how one can be scared and smile at the same time. And I'm 
I'm also suspicious of you. I think you understand very well. I think you know that when I get scared, I laugh or I kid to cover up. Uh, but do you have stage for us? Uh, I don't know. Do I'm mostly stage? aware of you. I'm afraid that... Uh, I'm afraid you're going to have such a direct attack that uh, you're going to get me in the corner and I'm afraid of it. I want you to be more on my you side. You think I get you in your corner and you put your hand on your chest. Mm -hmm. Is this your corner? Well, it's like, yeah, it's like I'm afraid, you know. Where would you like to go? Can you describe the corner you like to go to? Yeah. Uh, it's back in the corner where where I'm completely protected. And then you would be safe of me, for me. Well, I know I wouldn't really. Well, but imagine it feels safer. This, yeah. Well, imagine you were in this corner. And you're perfectly safe now. What would you do in that corner? I just sit. Just, uh, just sit? Yes. No. How long would you sit? I don't know, but this is so funny as you're saying this. This reminds me of when I was a little girl. Every time I was afraid, I'd feel better sitting in a corner. Okay, you're panicky. Are you a little girl? Well, no, but it's the same feeling. Are you a little girl? This feeling reminds me of it. Are you a no, little girl? No, no, no. Not at last. How old are you? Thirty. Then you're not a little girl. No. Okay. So you're a thirty-year-old girl who's afraid of a guy like me. Well, I don't even know if I'm. I, I do know I'll be afraid of you. you. I get real defensive with you. Now, what can I do to you? You can't do anything, but I can sure feel dumb. And I can feel stupid for not having the right answers. Now, what would it do for you to be, feel dumb and stupid? I hate it when I'm stupid. What would it do for you to be dumb and stupid? Let me put it so, like this. What would it do to me if you would play dumb and stupid? It makes you all the smarter and all the higher above me. Then I really have to look up to you because oh. you're so smart. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And butter me up right the left. No, I think you can do that all by yourself. Oh. I think the other way around. If you play dumb and stupid, you force me to be more explicit. <sighs> That's been said to me before, but I don't buy it. I don't know. Uh, what are you doing with your feet now? Wiggling them. <laughs> What's the joke now? Oh, I'm afraid you're going to notice everything I do. Gee. I do you want me to? I, I want you to help me become more relaxed. Yes, I don't want to be so defensive with you. I don't like to feel so defensive. Um... You're acting like you're treating me as if I'm stronger than I am, and I want you to protect me more and be nicer to me. Are you aware of your smile? You don't believe about what you're <laughs> I do too, but I know you're going to pick on me for it. <laughs> sure, you're bluff, you're phony. Do you believe, are you meaning that seriously? Yeah. If you see you're afraid and you laugh and you giggle and you squirm, it's phony. You put in a performance for me. Oh, I I resent that very much. Can you express it? Yes, sir. I most certainly am not being phony. I, I will admit this. It's hard for me to show my embarrassment, and I hate to be embarrassed. But, boy, I resent you calling me a phony. Just because I smile when I'm embarrassed or I'm put in a corner doesn't mean I'm being a phony. Wonderful. Thank you. You didn't smile for the last minute. Well, I'm mad at you. That's, I. Uh, that's right. You didn't have to cover up your anger with your smile. Now, you, in that moment, in that minute, you were not afraid. Well, at that minute, I was mad, though. I wasn't embarrassed. Yes, in other words, when you're mad, you're not a phony. I still resent that. I'm not a phony when I'm nervous. Again. I, I want to get mad at you. I, I, you know what I had to do? I, 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 I want you on my level. So I can pick on you just as much as you're picking on me. Okay, pick on me. I have to wait till you say something that I can pick on. But what does this mean? Can you develop this movement? It's, uh, I can't find words. I want to... Develop this. As if you were dancing. I want to 
I'll start all over again with you. Okay, that's not going to I know a corner I'd like to put you on. I'd like to ask you a question, and, and because I have a feeling you don't like me right off the bat, and I want to know if you do. Can you not play Fritz Perls, not liking Gloria? What would he say? He'd say that she's a phony, for one. Say so you are a phony. You're a phony, and you're a flip little girl, and you're a show-off. And what would Gloria answer to that? I, I, I know what I'd answer. I'd say I think you are, too. Well, say, tell this to me. Tell me what a phony I am. Well, I'm... Say, Fritz, you're a phony. Phony is not quite the right word, but it's more like a, a show-off. A show-off. Like you know all the answers. Yeah. And I want you to be more human, and that doesn't seem very human to me. To know all the answers is not very human. Yeah, to right away find out how I'm kicking my feet and why am I doing like this. Why are you doing like that? Oh, dear, I've got eyes. I can see you kicking your feet. I don't need a uh, scientific computer to see that you're kicking your feet. Let's speak about that. You don't need to be wise to see that you're kicking your feet. I know, but it seems like you're trying to find some reason for it. I don't. It's your imagination. Okay, I know what I'd like from you. Can I tell you what I'd like from you? Yeah. I'd like you to be aware that I'm kicking my feet and to be aware that I'm giggling when I'm really nervous and accept it instead of putting me on the defense of having to explain it. I don't want to have to explain why I'm doing these things. Did I ask you to explain? You said, why am I or what am I doing? No. Well, yes. what am I doing, you said. That's right, kicking your feet. I didn't ask you to explain it. It's your imagination. It's not this for it. It's the place of your imagination. It's a big difference. Now do this again. Again. How do you feel now? I don't know. Playing stupid. I'm I, not playing stupid. I don't see, know I the don't right know. answer. This is playing stupid. <clears throat> you did something with your hair there. Is there any chance something in my hair that you object to? No. No. Okay. No, but I, uh, your your hair and your features go along with the, the feeling I had about you earlier. I, I had a feeling I could be afraid of you. <coughs> and you're the type of person that seems like you demand so much respect and so you're... <sighs> Please play Fritz. I demand so much respect. Play this Fritz you just saw. Well, you know how smart I am. I know more about psychology than you do, Gloria. So anything I say, of course, is right. Can you say the same as Gloria, something similar as Gloria? But the same act as Gloria. I demand respect because... I don't know. You don't no, I don't. I identify it with my father, but not me. I don't feel I demand respect. You don't demand respect? No. Sure. As a matter of fact, I'd like more. I'd like you to respect me more. No, you see? So you demand respect. All right, yes. Yes, as a matter of fact, if I could demand respect from you, I would. But do it. Who's preventing you except yourself? Because I feel if I get myself out on the corner, you're going to let me just... Drown. You're not going to help me one bit, and I know that I can't quite come up to standards with you. What should I do when you're the crook? Encourage me to come up. Ah. Oh, you don't have enough courage to come up by yourself. You need something to pull little memes in distress out of a crook. Yes. So anytime you want somebody to uh, pay attention to you, call into a corner. And wait till the rescue comes. Yes, that's exactly what I'd like. And this is what I call phony. 
Pardon me? This is what I call phony. Why is it phony? I'm admitting to you what I am. How is that a phony? That is a phony. Because oh. it's a trick, it's a gimmick to call into a call and wait there till somebody comes to your rescue. I'm admitting it. I know what I'm doing. I'm not being phony. I'm not pretending I'm so brave. I resent that. I feel like you're saying unless I come out openly and stand on my own, I'm not a phony. Baloney. I'm just as, right. just as real sitting in that corner as I am out here all by myself. But you're not sitting in that corner. Well, not now. And besides that, it's like passing judgment when you call me phony. I just hate that anyway. Now we're getting somewhere. I call anybody phony who puts in an act. And if you like somebody and you want to meet this person, to go to this person, tell him, I would like to meet you, I would call not phony. But if you coyishly go into that corner, <coughs> waiting to be rescued, this I call phony. This I call phony. And I still think you're judgmental. You know what I have a feeling? You've never felt this way in your life. You feel so secure that you don't have to feel anybody that does something like this, you're going to pass judgment on their being a phony. Well, I resent it. Good. Now play Fritz passing judgment. You are. You're sitting up there in your play big old Fritz. chair. I am Fritz. I pass judgment. Pass judgment on me now. I don't feel close to you at all, Dr. Pearls. I feel that's phony. I feel like you're playing one big game. Right. Sure, you're playing games, but in spite of the games, I think I've touched you now and then. I think I hurt you when I caught you a phony. Well, of course you did. And I think I hit the bullseye. That's why you feel hurt. I don't know. All I know is when somebody, when I feel the way I feel with you right now, now I, it's uh, like you don't have feeling. I now exaggerate this. But you just did. I'm just like that. Now talk to me like I that. I can't. I can't. I want to laugh. I want to, I'd like you to be younger than me so I could really scold you. How old must I be? My age, 30. Good, I'm 30 now. Imagine I'm 30. And now you're scolding. Okay, don't be so cocksure of yourself. Don't think you're so doggone smart. Don't act so proud because you've never been in the corner. I think you can be just as big a phony parading around like you're so damn smart and you know all the answers as much as me sitting in my corner. Wow. Oh, and I like the feeling of you being younger. Yeah. I'd like to really, I'd like to embarrass you. Yeah, well, embarrass me. Well, well, you, tell me what you wouldn't get embarrassed. You seem unaffected. Tell me, embarrass me. Tell me how old, how ugly I am. <coughs> you don't look old and ugly, you look distinguished. Oh. And that gives you, that's all the more on your side. If you look so distinguished, then see. That's more on your side, too. Well, Gloria, can we say one thing? We had quite a good fight. No, I know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. I, felt I don't think you're fighting with me. But I felt you came out quite a bit. Well, I'm mad at you. Wonderful. But you seem so detached. You don't even seem to care that I'm mad at you. <coughs> I feel you like mean? you're not recognizing me at all, Dr. Pearls. Not a bit. This is quite true. Our contact is much too superficial to be involved in caring. I care for you as far as, let's see, you're right now my client. I care for you as far as I like to, like an artist, bring something out which is hidden in you. This is as far as I care. Well, I'd like you to, I'd like to feel that there's some, it's frustrating. If I were to leave you right now and not see you again, it would frustrate me to feel like there hadn't been more contact. I feel completely out of contact with you. Like I'm talking to the baby that doesn't understand me, or something like that. I don't feel like we're a bit in contact, and that, ooh, that frustrates me. That bothers me more than being angry with you. I'd rather we were angry and fought than to have no contact. Yeah, this reminds me of when my husband and I used to fight. He sits there and he listens to me, but he's not even aware of how much I hate him and how mad I am at him. I'd rather, yeah, I'd rather affect you. You to really hate me or something. And I feel like you're purposely staying out of contact with me. How should I be? Give me your fantasy. How, sh how could I share you my concern with you? 
I can't say in words. I know the feeling of, I've seen on you, but I can't say. It's just a feeling like, I don't know. It's like I want you to respect me more as a human being, that I've got feelings. Now we come back to the beginning. So you want respect. Yes, I do. I do. See? This is a different kind of respect than I meant the Never first time. Mind, but, but you want, you need respect. Yes. Yeah. I respect you so much as a human being that I refuse to accept the phony part of yourself and address myself to the genuine part. Right now, the last few minutes, you were wonderfully genuine. You were not playing anymore. And I could see you were really hurting. Well, I don't feel I've got a right when I don't like somebody or I disagree with somebody who's doing if If I should respect them, if they're above me, they're superior to me, I don't feel I've got a right to really, really tell you how mad that's, I am. That's, that's your bitch. We're not jackety jackety. You're getting back into your safe corner. Well, that's the way it feels. That's what the safe corner feels like to me. Right. Now go back to your safe corner. Because you have to part very soon. You stay in your safe corner. You came out for a moment. You nearly met me. You could get a little bit angry with me. Now go back to your safety. I feel like you're telling me the only way you respect me as a human being if I'm aggressive and forceful and strong. Yeah, I thought you couldn't even accept my... I'd be scared to death to cry in front of you. I feel like you'd laugh at me and call me a phony. I feel like you don't accept my weak side only when I'm yelling back at you or hollering at you. You mustn't cry in my presence. Well, I wouldn't even give you the satisfaction. Say this again. No. Say this again. I try not to. I try not to cry in front of you or show my weak spot for fear you'd jump on me again. Are you aware that your eyes are moist? I'm aware that I feel more choky. Yes, I feel that. Could you choke me? Pretend, but not for real. Why not for real? Well, because I don't hate you that much. No, you want to choke my tears back. You want me to choke you so you wouldn't cry? I'd like to. If I'd like to choke you, it would be to make you cry. I'd like to see you weak. I'd like to see you hurt and, and vulnerable. What would do this do for you? Make me feel like I'm... I have more of a right to be hurt and you wouldn't jump on me so quick. Would you jump on me if I would cry? No. Mm -mm. But I would jump on you if you would cry. You're sure of this? No, I'm not sure of it. Uh -huh. what, would, what would you like me to do if you were to cry? I was... Uh, you're smiling, you're smiling something off. Well, because I got two feelings. I was going to say I want you to, I want you to love me and hug me. But then I thought, no, I don't want to. What's your objection? I'd be scared to be too close to you. Now we're getting somewhere. First you want to be close to me. Now you're afraid to be too close to me. That's See? what I'm saying, but... That's right. Now we got the two poles of your existence. But they're two different feelings. Close, I mean emotionally, but not physically. But we've got the two poles of your existence now. Either far away in a corner, or be so close that you get melted into one with the other person. And apparently you travel between the two extremes. I do. You know what I'm thinking? When I am really hurt and really uh, upset about something, and I want someone to love me, like my girlfriend will do it a lot, and she'll come up to hug me, I don't, I don't want it. Exactly. See? That's what I'm talking about. You cannot sustain contact. Okay, this is not you... rubbish. What are you afraid if you were too close to your girlfriend, if you let her hug you? Uh, the only thing I'm aware of is, like when I perspire, it embarrasses me that she feel how wet I am, and that she'd hold my body up close, and I don't know. Just Are you aware of your facial expression, the kind of disgust? Yeah. I mean, yes, it. I am. Now do this more, please. Ugh. It's icky. I'm, <laughs> it's just icky. I can just feel what it is. I don't like it. Can you say this to me, Fritz? You're icky. Well, 
No. What's your difficulty? Because I feel like if you really believe me, that would hurt your feelings. Oh, you must know my feelings. Well... I thought I was so indifferent, as you said before, that no, nothing could touch no, me. No, no. Now you suddenly discovered a way to touch me, isn't it? Well, you know what I believe? I believe you're the type of person, sort of like me, that you act like it wouldn't hurt your feelings, but it really would. You act strong, but you're, you're soft and vulnerable inside there, too. I think your feelings could be hurt, sure. <laughs> But I don't think you'd show it very easy. What would I do? How would I conceal my feelings? By turning it back on me. <coughs> By saying, now, what did you get from that, Gloria? You'd turn the whole thing back on me instead of showing how hurt you were. Now, can you see this to Fritz? How did you, what did you get out of this, Fritz? Say this to me. What'd you get out of what? What you just said, just a sentence. Sure, I know what you'd get out of it. If I said, what did you get out of this, Fritz? You'd say, nothing. It didn't bother me. It was you that did it. You still wouldn't let me know you were hurt. But I know what it would be if you told your true feelings, that you didn't want to show your hurt, so you covered it up. Same way with me in the corner. Now, if I were hurt, if I would cry, what would you do with me? You would be, you wouldn't be so superior to me. You'd be more vulnerable, and I could pacify you and make you feel better. Could hug me. Yes. And I could be the baby. Yes. Yes. I'd like that. You'd feel more on my level. I wouldn't have to feel so dumb with you. And the other way around, you would have to be my baby. She would cry. You would like to play the baby and be comforted and hugged and the poor thing. Well, I'd like that man. too. Well, I'll tell you something, Louis. I think we came to a nice closure. I think we came to a little bit of understanding. I think we finished this scene, situation now. Well? All right. Uh, the demonstration was, in my opinion, uh, quite successful and consistent with my theoretical outlook. The avoidance of the genuine encounter manifested itself in three ways. The patient was first taking control by putting on a smiling, sophisticated, phony mask of oscillating between a pretense of being frightened and yet at the same time having me figured out, thus being or believing to be fully in control of the situation. Secondly, she was withdrawing by fantasizing of hiding in a corner. Thirdly, she was blocking the real encounter of melting through crying, which then would have been the real emotional meaning of this meeting. The patient was capable of identifying herself with several fantasies she had projected onto me. She was, this was especially evident with regard to her initial denial for a need to be respected. The need for environmental support started to come out besides her need to get respected. It was verbalized in her wish to be cared for, rescued from the corner, and so on. I broke off the session when the first tears began to appear. She began to play the role of the lonely child and apparently wanted to be hugged and comforted. But here too the assimilation of her projection began to work and she began to experience holding me like a baby. Apart from assisting her and assimilating her in some projections, the main therapeutic factor was to show how the inconsistency of her verbal and nonverbal behavior. For instance, saying that she was frightened and smiling at the same time. A frightened person does not smile. Where I feared was in the direction of her embarrassment. And this embarrassment was protected by her brazenness and anger. To get to her existential embarrassment, we would have to work through and eliminate the phoniness, that is the ease 
with which we can superficially assume any role that is required for a specific situation. This pseudo-adaptation is her way of coping with life. This is about what I got out of this session. Rational therapy, a rational emotive therapy, also called RT for short, is based on several fundamental propositions or hypotheses. And the first of these is that the past is not crucial in a person's life. The past affects him a good deal, but he affects himself much more than the past affects him. Because no matter what he has learned during his historical development, the only reason why these things that have happened to him and that have been told to him affect him today is because he is still re-indoctrinating himself with the same philosophies of life, the same values that he usually imbibed and taught himself to early in his childhood. So we stick largely in the present in rational emotive psychotherapy rather than in the past. And we believe that today the individual experiences negative emotions, self-defeating behavior, inefficiencies, because he now is indoctrinating himself with what we call simple exclamatory sentences, which involve ideas. Human beings can tell themselves ideas in all kinds of languages, in pictures, in sign languages and nonverbal expression in math, for example, but they normally speak to themselves in simple English if English is their native tongue. And when they talk to themselves in an irrational or an illogical way, then they create, they literally create their negative feelings or emotions and the behavior that follows therefrom. Now, just to give an example, the individual usually tells himself when he's upset, first a sane sentence and then an insane sentence. The sane sentence is something along the order of, I don't like the thing that I've done. I dislike my own behavior. And that would be fine, but unfortunately he follows it with an insane sentence, which says to himself, and because I don't like my behavior, I am a louse, I am worthless, I am a no goodnik. And this thoroughly insane sentence, which is a sentence of faith unfounded on fact, which has no empirical reference, which is a kind of superstitious or dogmatically religious system, creates what we call his anxiety, and through his anxiety, his depression, his guilt, his other forms of self-defeatism. Or again, the individual tells himself the same sentence, I don't like your behavior, when, let us say, somebody has acted badly with him, and instead of following that up with, that because I don't like your behavior, I can still stand it, and I'm going to try to change, to get you to change your behavior, he says, I can't stand your behavior, or in an absolutistic, godlike, grandiose manner, you shouldn't be the way you are because I think that I don't like the way you are. Now, it's the second, the B sentences, which upset the individual. Or another way of putting it, as Epictetus, a Roman philosopher, said many years ago, it's not what happens to us at point A that it upsets us, it's B, a view of what happens to us. And in rational emotive psychotherapy, we go after this individual, the patient's view, and show him that whatever he thinks has upset him, usually some external situation, what somebody else has done, it's really what he's telling himself about this thing, this event, which upsets him. And although he may never be able to do anything about the external event at A, he can change the internal event, his sentence, his belief to himself at B. Now, in rational emotive psychotherapy, we try to show the patient three kinds of insight and kinds of distinctions to some other therapies, which usually emphasize one major kind. The first kind we try to show him is that all his behavior, especially his negative self-defeating behavior, which we're interested 
which is upsetting him, has clear-cut ideological antecedents. He may have learnt these, as I said before, in the past, but right now, today, he must still believe these same ideologies, else he would not get the negative behavior that flows therefrom. And insight number two, which is most important and which is unfortunately neglected in many other systems of psychotherapy, is that he, being, as Ernst Cassira once said, a symbolizing animal, is continually re-indoctrinating himself with these ideologies. And that's the issue. That's why he's now disturbed. Now, insight number three is that even when he sees clearly what he's telling himself and that he's telling himself nonsense, only by work and practice, by continually reassessing and revaluing his own philosophic assumptions, will he ever get better. Now, we also stress the fact that action is necessary to change an individual just Talking about things, thinking about things is nice, but not necessary. Uh, I should say it's not a necessary condition for a psychotherapeutic can cha change. What the individual has to do in addition usually is act. And we therefore give him concrete homework assignments and get him to act these out and check up and follow to see whether he does these homework assignments. And our final goal is to get the individual to learn and learn for the rest of his life to challenge and question his own basic value systems, his own thinking, so that he really thinks for himself. He must do this particularly when he feels miserable, he feels anxiety, or depression, or guilt, or too much frustration, or anything else that is negative, or when he behaves very inefficiently. And finally, he was able, through this kind of new thinking, rethinking his own assumptions, to apply what we call the scientific method to the facets of human living and to be truly scientific in his behavior, to question and challenge his own assumptions as we do in science, and thereby to minimize, though never entirely, to eliminate the terrible anxiety and the atrocious hostility which unfortunately affects most of us in this existence. Hello, Gloria. I'm Dr. Ellen. Be seated, please. Okay. Well, would you like to tell me what's bothering you most? Hmm. Yeah. I think the things that I'd like to talk to you the most about are adjusting to my single life. Uh, most of men, I guess. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I don't know if I'm doing the wrong thing, but I'm going to refer to your book anyway because. This is what I'm impressed with, this book about the Intelligent Woman's Guide to Man, honey. Yeah. I tried to follow it, and I believe in it. This is why it's so fun reading your book, because I'm not much of a reader, but I sort of believe the same way you do. And then I've got a problem in this area. The men that I do, I'm attracted to, or the type of man I'd like to become closely involved with, I can't seem to meet, or I get too shy with, or something that I don't... It just doesn't click. The men I seem to be dating nowadays are the ones that I don't respect much, the ones I don't enjoy much, that seem flip and uninteresting. Well, and I don't know if it's something about me or what, because I really do want to meet this kind of man. Well, let's talk a little about your shyness. Let's suppose you meet somebody who you consider eligible that you might want. Now, let's see if we can get at the source of your shyness, just what you're telling yourself to create this. You meet this man and you feel shy, embarrassed, Yes, but I don't usually show that. I usually act flip right back. Yeah. I act like the other men act to me, as a matter of fact. I act flip. I don't seem near as intelligent. I act like a typical dumb blonde. Uh, I'm just I'm just not myself with him. I'm more on at ease. Yes. Well, as you probably know from extra man hunting, I believe that people only get emotions such as negative emotions of shyness, embarrassment, shame, because they tell themselves something in simple exclamatory sentences. Now, let's try to find out what you're telling yourself. You're meeting this individual. Now, what do you think you're saying to yourself before you get... I know what it is that I'm not... I don't stand up to his expectations. I'm not quite enough for him. He's superior to me. Although I want this type of man, I'm afraid I won't have enough to attract him. 
Well, that's the first part of the sentence, and that might be a true one, because maybe he could be superior to you in some ways. Maybe he wouldn't be attracted to you, but that would never upset you if you were only saying that. I think he may be superior to me. Now, you're adding a second sentence to that, which is, if this is so, that would be awful. Well, not quite so extreme as that, because yeah. I thought about that, too. It's usually, I've missed my chance again, because when I want to become... If I want to show the very best of myself, because I think I have self-confidence and I have enough to offer. Yeah. But when I get afraid like that, then I show all the bad qualities. I, I'm flip, I'm... Then I'm, I'm so much on the defensive that I can't show my good qualities. And it's like, I missed my chance again. There was a good opportunity to be close to this man and I lost it up again. All right, but even let's suppose you're saying that, and I think you really are, but you must be saying something else too, because if you were just saying, hell, I missed my chance again, you'd say, all right, next time, I'll take advantage of what I learned this time and do it a little better. Now, you still must be saying, if you feel shame, embarrassment, shyness, there's something pretty bad about your error in missing your chance again. I don't know if this follows in context of what you're saying, but the thing I do feel is that I get suspicious then. Am I the type of woman that will only appeal to the ones that are to not my type of guy anyway. Is there yeah. something wrong with me? Am I never going to find the kind of man I enjoy? I always seem to get the other ones. All right, now you're getting closer to what I'm talking about, because you're really saying, if I am this type of woman that none of these good, eligible males are going to appeal to, then that would be awful. I'd never get what I want, and that would really be something frightful. Plus, it? I don't like thinking of myself that way. I want to put myself on a higher standard. I don't like to think that I may be just an average Jane Doe. But let's just suppose for the sake of argument at the moment that that were so, right. that you were an average Jane Doe. Now, would that be so terrible? It would be inconvenient. It would be unpleasant. You wouldn't want it. But would you get an emotion like shyness, embarrassment, shame, out of just believing that maybe I'm going to end up like Jane Doe. I don't know. Well, I don't think you could, because you still would have to be saying on some level, as I think you've just said, and it would be very bad. It would be terrible. I would be a no good Nick if I were just well, Jane Doe. Well, plus, I'd never get what I want. If I were just a Jane Doe, and if I'd have to accept that, I'd never get what I want, and I don't want to live the rest of my life with just icky men. Well, I want not... Necessarily so that you'd never, you really mean your chances would be reduced because we know some icky girls who get some splendid men, don't oh, we? That's yeah. Right. You that's see, right. so you're generalizing there. You're saying it probably would be that I'd have a more difficult time, but then you're jumping to, therefore, I'd never get it all. You well, see the catastrophizing there that you jump to. Yes, but it feels that way to me at the time. It seems like forever. That's right, but isn't that a vote of non confidence in you? An essential yes. vote of non confidence? Yes. And the non-confidence is because you're saying, one, I don't want to miss out on things. I would like to get the kind of a man I want and be a, uh, in your words, superior kind of girl who gets a superior kind of man. Yes. But if I don't, then I'm practically on the other side of the chain completely a no good mix, somebody who will never get anything that I want, which is quite an extreme away, isn't it? Yeah. And that's what I call catastrophizing, taking a true statement, and there is a good deal of truth in what you're saying, if you didn't get the kind of a man you wanted, that it would be inconvenient, annoying, frustrating, which it really would be, and then saying, I'd never possibly get what I want, and even beyond that, you're really saying, and then I couldn't be a happy human being. Aren't you really saying that on yeah. some level? But let's just look at that. Let's just assume the worst, as Bertrand Russell once said years ago. Assume the worst, that you never got at all, for whatever the reasons may be, the kind of a man you want. Look at all the other things you could do in life to be happy. Well, I don't like the whole process. I don't even like it if I'm going through it. I don't... All right, even if it wasn't a catastrophe, yeah. even if I didn't look at it as a catastrophe, I don't like the way I'm living right now. For example, when I meet somebody that I'm interested in that could have some potential, right away I find I'm not near as relaxed with him. I worry more, should I be friendly? Should I kiss him goodnight? Should I do this? If it's just a Joe Doe and I don't give a darn, I can be anything I want to be. I try not to be more of a person when I'm not as concerned. I don't like the way I'm, uh, I, I, I But you're not, you're not merely concerned, you're over-concerned, you're anxious. Because if you were just concerned, you'd do your best and you'd be saying to yourself, if I succeed, great. If I don't succeed, tough. 
right now I won't get what I want. But you're over concerned or anxious. You're really saying again, as what we said a moment ago, if I don't get what I want right now, I'll never get it. And that would be so awful that I've got to get it right now. That causes the anxiety, doesn't it? Yes, or else work toward it. Yes, but if, if you, I don't get it right now, that's all right. But I want to feel like I'm working toward it. Yes, but you want a guarantee, I hear. My trained ears hear you saying I would like a guarantee of working towards it. And there are no certain Well, no, Dr. Ellis, I, I don't know why I'm coming out that way. What I really mean is I want a step toward working toward it. Well, what's I stopping want, you? I don't know. I thought, well, what I was hoping is whatever this is in me, why I don't seem to be attracting these kind of men, why I seem more on the defensive, why I seem more afraid, you could help me what it is I'm afraid of, so I won't do it so much. Well, my hypothesis is so far that what you're afraid of is not just failing with this individual man, which is really the only thing at issue when you go out with a new, and we're talking about eligible males now, we'll rule out the ineligible ones. You're not just afraid that you'll miss this one. You're afraid that you'll miss this one, and therefore you'll miss every other, and therefore you prove that you are really not up to getting what you want, and wouldn't that be awful. You're bringing in these catastrophes. Well, you sound more strong at it, but that's similar. I feel like this this is silly if I keep this up. But you keep There's what something up? I'm doing. There's something I'm doing that could be as real a person with these men that I'm interested that's in. That's right. You're defeating your own ends by the... I've done it again. Right. If I weren't so doggone anxious about trying to hook this guy, I could be more real. He's going to enjoy me more if I'm real anyway. So I'm only giving him the stinky part of me. Right. How can anybody I respect respect a, a chooch? And that's what I am when I don't really come through. But look how you just devalued yourself. Let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, you kept giving the stinky part of you. A human being, another person who's trying to get interested in you, might not like these attributes, these characteristics of you, but I don't think he's going to despise you as a person who no. you are really doing. I don't, I, I'm harder on myself than I think That's he is. That's exactly the point. he just doesn't like me. There's not enough to me. Right. And I say before, if people just didn't like you and you went through enough of them, and it would be hard to go through enough, but it would be possible, you'd eventually find one who did like you and whom you liked. But as long as you devalue yourself personally in your own eyes, you complicate the problem enormously and you're not focusing on how can I be myself, change the traits. If you, for example, had a, let us just say, a mangled arm and you wouldn't accept your whole person, your being, because of this mangled arm, then you would focus so much on that mangled arm that you wouldn't be able to do things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. That's almost what I do, yes. Yes, that's you say that's exactly, so you're taking a part of you, an arm, and focusing almost completely on that, in, uh, just to bring it down to our own conversation, you're taking a part of you, your shyness, your not being yourself with males, and focusing so much on that part that you're almost making it the whole of you. And you get a, an awful picture of your total self because of this defective part, and we're assuming, you and I, that it is defective. We're not glossing over and saying, no, you're doing all right. You're not doing that well. Right. Now, if you could accept yourself for the time being, with this defective part, with these attributes, and not beat yourself over the head, as I feel you definitely are doing, then it becomes a relatively simple problem to work and practice, to work and practice against this negative attribute. In other words, let's get back to that now, how to be yourself. Let's just suppose for the moment that you really were fully accepting yourself with your failings. All right. You know you're going to go out, you know you're going to screw up with the next man, man after that in all probability, but you're saying, all right, I have to go through a learning process, that's too bad. I won't be very good during this while, but I'll do it just as I would at ice skating where I'd have to fall on my neck for a few times before I learned to ice skate. Okay, now let's suppose that. Then, if that was so, if you were really accepting you, you go out, take the risks of being you. Because after all, if you do win one of these men, you have to be yourself. You're not winning them for a day, you're not winning them for a fair, I assume you want to marry one of these individuals eventually and be with them a long time. But mostly a long later. relationship. I don't think so much yes. marriage is a long All relationship. right, a long relationship in the mm -hmm. course of which you couldn't act. So we don't want to give you some technique acting well that he'll later find out was a role playing mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. So you have to eventually be yourself. Now, if you really weren't so disturbed about these present, current failings of yours, you could go out and be this self of yours, ask yourself, what do I really want to do with this man? to help enjoy him and have him help enjoy me, because that's the basic function of life, enjoyment, which we tend to lose. And you force yourself to take the risk of being that. Because if you succeeded, great. 
If you fail, too bad. Either you're not for him, or he may even not be for you. Because don't forget, you said before, when these men reject you, you assume right away it must be my doing and my fault. You know, they may not be your cup of tea, and you may not be their cup of tea, and it's nobody's fault. It's just true incompatibility, right, be, yes. you see. Yes. So if you would really accept yourself as you are and then force yourself, and if you were one of my regular patients, I would give you this homework assignment and then check up on you to see whether you could force yourself to open your big mouth and be you for a while, even though it hurt with these males, you would find that A, you would start being yourself and gradually lopping off these inefficiencies, which incidentally are the result of not being you, but watching yourself from the outside while you're trying to be you, which is almost impossible, because you can't spy on yourself and still be yourself very well at the same time. No, but it would become like a habit. After a while, if you took the risks and forced yourself to, as I said, open your big mouth, and even though you thought, maybe it'll come out badly, maybe he won't like me, maybe I'll lose him completely, and so on and so forth, then you'd start swinging in the groove and being what you want to be, and I would almost guarantee that you'd become more practiced and less inefficient, especially in terms of the shyness, because you wouldn't be focusing on, oh my God, isn't this awful how bad I am? You would be focusing on what a nice individual this is, and how can I enjoy him, which is the Oh, the focus. Well, you're saying my focus is the opposite way. Right. How can I be more attractive to him, and how can he be pleased by me? Because well. underneath, if I am not, then I cannot enjoy myself. I refuse to accept myself unless I attract and win this good individual. Isn't that what you basically Yes, say? and I even go further, Dr. Ellis, when, uh, when there is one of these men I come in contact with. And I find that I want to cultivate more of a relationship. Well, if he accepts me and we're going along pretty great, I find myself constantly on the defensive. Constantly right. watching the way I sit, not right. drinking too much. Right. The whole time, instead of just relaxing and saying, he'll either like me or he doesn't. The most in psychotherapy, you're giving a very good illustration of why other directiveness, other directiveness doesn't pay. Because if you really are defining yourself, in terms of others' estimation of you, then even when you're ahead of the game and you're winning them, you have to be saying to yourself, will I win them today? Will I win them tomorrow? Will I keep winning them? And you're always focused on, am I doing the thing to please him? And you never are yourself. You never have a self. While if you're saying, what do I want to do in life? There must be some human beings who would like me the way I am. Let's see if this is one of those human beings. Then that's the only way, isn't it, that you can be... You see? Yeah. Now, we haven't got too much time now, so let's try to get it off on a constructive note of more concretely what you can do. You asked before where you can go, how you can meet new people. I'd say that I don't know this particular area, but it's almost any place. If you could do what we are talking about, really take risks and focus on what you want out of life, and on the fact that it's going to take time, which unfortunately it does, and it is not awful, and you are not awful while it's taking that time, then you can leave yourself open unshyly to all kinds of new encounters. And these encounters can take place on buses while waiting for a streetcar, if they have streetcars in this area, at cocktail parties. Anywhere, you can talk to people who look eligible. You can ask your friends to get you eligible to let mails and so on. But the main thing is that you have to, A, like yourself while you're not doing badly and B, not be intolerant against conditions which are bad. And I'm agreeing with you that they are. Now, as I said, I would give you, if you were a patient of mine, the homework assignment of deliberately, very deliberately, going out and getting yourself into trouble. In other words, taking the most eligible males you can find at the moment and forcing yourself, risking yourself to be you. Are you saying even if it were like if I went into a doctor's office to start a conversation with him because he was attracted to me or he appealed to me? Right. Even go so far as to starting out a conversation with him, a personal one? Why not? If he's an eligible individual, any kind of an eligible individual. Well, I know you accept that, but that seems awfully brazen. Well, let's suppose it is brazen. What have you got to lose? The worst he can do is reject you, and you don't have to reject you if you were thinking along the lines that we've been talking five minutes or so. Oh, yeah. Now, can you try to do that? I think. I think so. 
It oh. sort of gives me a spurt to uh, go out and see. You're right. That's all I can do is be rejected. Right. And that leaves you intact. It just leaves you, unfortunately, not for the moment getting what you want. So you try the one you've already read, and I'll be very interested in finding out what happens. Oh, I'm excited about it. Well, it was certainly very nice meeting you, Gloria. Thank you, Doctor. I enjoyed talking with this interesting and, I think, highly courageous patient and thought that it gave a, the session gave a pretty good illustration of a fairly typical session of rational emotive psychotherapy. How was it typical? In several ways. In the first place, I was able rather rapidly and quickly to get to some of what I think are the philosophic cores of the patient's disturbances to show her that the reason she is feeling shy and ashamed and afraid in this instance is because, even though partially unwittingly, she is defining herself in a very negative way or devaluing herself by blaming herself too much for imperfect behavior. Because perfectionism is the root of most human evils. And she was showing some fairly typical perfectionistic notions. So very quickly, as is usually done in rational emotive psychotherapy, we skip some of the asides, we skip going back into the history as some of the psychoanalysts do, and we skip some of the transference relations between us and the patient, and we skip some of the nonverbal expression, not that we think these things are quite unimportant, but we think they're of relatively little relevance to the basic core of the patient's disturbance, which is her philosophy of life. And typically, again, this patient showed both anxiety and low frustration tolerance, which most patients showed, and these were intertwined, and again, very usually, she was then beating herself over the head, blaming herself, condemning herself for feeling these kinds of feelings. Now, she did not see very clearly, at least I thought so at the beginning of the session, exactly what declarative sentences and exclamatory sentences she was telling herself to create these feelings and I endeavored to show her some of these sentences and what could be done about it. And among other things I also, though briefly, because this is just one brief session, tried to give her a homework assignment that she could go and get her teeth into and actively try to do to depropagandize herself by going out and taking risks which normally up to now she hasn't been taking that much of. It's interesting to note that again quite typically in this session, although I was attacking fairly vigorously the patient's attitudes and philosophies, she did not feel an attack on her. She felt that I was supporting her if anything and she ended up, I thought, rather optimistically feeling that I had given her several ideas of what she could do in the future. Again, rather typically in this session, I kept persuading the patient and attacking her ideas and showing her that her philosophy of life not only was such and such, but that if she stuck to this kind of philosophy, she had to get negative and self-defeating results from it. And then I kept persistently going on, even though at times she became defensive and wasn't quite accepting by any means what I was saying, I didn't let this bother me, but kept going on against her basic core system, her value system, because this is again what bothers patients, that they give up very easily on attacking their own negative evaluations of themselves, and therefore they persist forever. Now there were limitations, of course, especially in terms of time to the session, and these limitations did have some effect. For example, there wasn't enough not enough time for repetition. In several sessions I would have gone over much of the same material until I was sure that it had sunk in. Then I would have had time to get feedback from the patient to see whether she really understood in action in particular what I was talking about and whether she was following it up or leading herself up some other diverting pathway which people can do. There was no time to emphasize that she would have to continually reassess her evaluations of herself and her general philosophies and do rethinking for the rest of her life. There was no time to show the patient very much that even during this session in relation to me and what she was saying about herself that she was displaying her bad attitudes toward herself. And finally, there was no occasion, of course, since this was an individual session, 
to see how she related specifically to other non-therapists, as she would in group therapy, and in the midst of this group situation to show her exactly what was going on and what she could do about it. But I do feel hope, hopeful about the session and think that perhaps I was able at least to give the patient a few ideas which she could then go out and work on on her own because unless patients do work themselves with the material that we therapists give them in psychotherapy, nothing eventually happens. It isn't any magic that we have for them, but we can give them certain catalytic ideas and influences which then if they work and practice that, work and practice that, will do them good for the rest of their lives.